the reverse repo market. So what's going on with that? Last night we just got uh, you know the overnight reverse repos almost reach one trillion dollars, which is the new all-time high. And for sure, all the expectations are that we will surpass one trillion. Uh, I even see so on Zero Hedge that uh, uh, I think it was Zoltar was expecting that we will reach 1.5 trillion uh, uh, by next Wednesday or Thursday, and we will even reach two trillion in the next couple of weeks. Two trillion in you know overnight reverse repos. So I want to talk about that in today's video. I also want to connect it to what's going on, uh, you know, with the banks, with inflation. How is that uh, similar to what was going on in 2008? And uh, just give you my thoughts about the matter. You know, I, I made my previous video about the reverse repo market. A lot of people liked it. I got a lot of uh, questions. Some I answered, some I'm going to answer in today's video. So uh, let's dive right in and uh, see some articles. First of all, let's take a look on this chart of the reverse repos. And we can see, as we can see, that they started on the 29th of March. And if you remember from the last video, I explained that on the 31 of March, we had the SLR exemption expiring. What is the SLR exemption? It was an exemption that was given to the banks not to calculate treasuries into their SLR uh, ratio calculations. The SLR calculations is a, some kind of regulation that was placed on the banks in 2008. And the purpose of that was to make the banks more safe, not to take too much leverage, not to take too much risks, basically to make the uh, system uh, less risky. And in 2020, in April, just after the merge crash, they were given an exemption uh, uh, from the Fed not to calculate treasuries into that calculation. What that made, it made the bank, uh, you know, buy more and more and more treasuries when they were looking for a place to put their cash, especially short-term treasuries. And that was also the short-term and medium-term treasuries that the treasury was selling. Uh, and, you know, now, so the seller, the treasury was selling all of this debt. They got all of this cash. They were using this cash, you know, uh, to give all sorts of stimulus packages and help the economy. And uh, uh, so that's where the treasuries were coming from. But when the 31, when the exemption expired, the banks had to get rid of those treasuries. But then what is the interesting thing that we see? We see that uh, uh, the reverse repos exploded when the exemption expired. And now you may ask me, how does that make sense that the banks had too much treasuries, but then they are going, what, are, what is a reverse repo? The banks are going to the Fed and they are giving the Fed cash overnight. The Fed is giving them even more treasuries. And you just told us, Ron, that the banks have too many treasuries. So because of the exemption, so what you can conclude is that they were supposed to sell them to meet, to meet requirements. But we have to remember that cash sits on the same place on the balance sheet as the treasuries. So the banks had to get rid either of cash or from treasuries. And we know that some big banks were uh, not accepting any more deposits from very big clients. So now we can see that the banks decided to get rid of their cash overnight to the Fed. And what I believe, what I understood from reading articles, from reading people like Rafi Farber and uh, you know Zoltan on Zero Hedge, is that uh, this... Uh, overnight treasuries are not, the, the banks don't have to calculate them into their SLR calculation because it's only overnight. And because they don't hold the cash, they also don't have to calculate the cash. So that is like some kind of like a loophole in their own system that the Fed has no problem to give it to the banks because there is a problem and the Fed doesn't want to cause more trouble. They don't want to cause some kind of a collapse. They don't want to make interest rate rise because that's what would happen if the banks sell their treasuries because if they sell the treasuries price of the treasury goes down and the interest on the treasury goes up that's how a treasury works so uh, that is basically what was going on and that is uh, in a short what was i was explaining in the previous video so uh, some guys asked me run why do you think i mean we understand uh, what what you're, it's very good what you understand with your uh, what you're explaining with the reverse repos, 
But why is that a bad thing? And the answer, I'm not sure it's a bad thing <laughs> because this is very uh, complicated and I'm actually not sure that reverse repos by themselves is a bad thing. What I'm trying to, uh, to say, there is pressure building up in the system. And every time that the Fed fix, you know, they put some kind of a plaster, some temporary fix on one place, and they don't relieve the pressure, the pressure starts showing up in another place. So the way I see it, reverse repos is a symptom to a deeper problem. Doesn't mean that the reverse repos by themselves is a bad thing. Either this is a, a, the reverse repos are a symptom to some other problem that is happening in the plumbing of the financial system that we don't understand. Or another explanation that I heard is that reverse repos is the Fed's, one of the tools that the Feds are trying to deploy right now. So when we get the next crisis, which the way I think about it is imminent, uh, and the Fed also think that, they will have another tool to deploy against uh, uh, that crisis. Not only QE that they are doing right now, which they can expand, they can also reverse the reverse repo in a way to fight another uh, downturn in the markets. So uh, that's that's the other explanation that I read. Now let's connect this to some article that I saw on Reddit. It was very interesting. It was about uh, 2008 and why we may experience right now something very similar. So let's take a look. So just to understand 2008 really, really quickly, let's talk about CDOs and CDSs. This is two types of derivatives and just try to understand that, okay? So what is a CDO? Basically, you know, the banks were selling loans, mortgages to home buyers, uh, and then these banks were selling those, uh, those mortgages to investment banks. Investment banks were buying a bunch of these mortgages. They also bought other type of debt. So maybe they bought some, they had car loans, they had the uh, credit card loans, and they were combining these into a CDO, which is a collateralized uh, debt obligation. Then they took the CDOs and they were selling them to pension funds or to, uh, you know, just to investors. Um, and basically those CDOs at the start, they were high grade, uh, really high grade, but very quickly the banks understood that they can take a little bit of, you know, uh, good debt and combine it with a lot of trash, a lot of junk debt. And then, you know, the rating agencies were just playing along and rating these CDOs as AAA, which is the best rating that, uh, uh, you know, debt can get. And then pension funds were buying this AAA debt, which was basically junk. Um, so that was basically what was going on in 2008. And not only that the banks were creating these junk uh, CDOs and selling them, they were using leverage to buy more mortgages than they can normally could. And so when everything explodes, they are stuck with leveraged amount of mortgages on their balance sheet that they didn't sell yet. And sorry. And um, so that was basically it. During the bubble from 2000 to 2007, the investment banks were borrowing heavily to buy more loans to create more CDOs. Okay. So they were using leverage, the system was leveraged. Now let's see what is a CDS. CDS is a credit default swap. Basically, you can buy an insurance on your CDO. And later, investors like Michael Berry used it as a speculation to bet against the CDO market. So let's say you are an investor, you bought a CDO, you're happy, you got your AAA investment tool that is giving you great, uh, you know, um, you can call it a dividend. Uh, it's not really dividend, but okay, it's giving you a great cash flow. And uh, you just want to make sure that even if some of your mortgages, you know, don't pay, even if some of them, uh, you know, fail, you want to be, uh, you want to uh, become whole. So you want someone to insure you, you go to AIG, you tell them, I want to buy a CDS, AIG tell you, perfect. So now if your CDO fails, AIG have to make you whole, have to pay for you. And in return, you pay AIG some kind of a fee. Now, the catch is that, so for a short term, AIG is making a ton of money, their CEOs are getting huge bonuses, but in the long term, they are taking massive risk. And they, the, the catch is that they don't have to put aside any money to back up their CDSs. So if a lot of the CDOs fails, 
AIG have no money put aside, you know, to handle that, to handle that uh, happening. So that's what happened. And um, uh, some banks were at some point, okay, let's see. So uh, yeah, C CDSs were unregulated. So AIG didn't have to set aside any money to cover the potential losses. Okay, great. And then you can see that Goldman Sachs would now, Let's see how the banks are acting in 2008. Goldman Sachs would purchase CDS from AIG to bend against the CDOs it didn't own and got paid when those CDSs failed. Goldman bought at least 22 billion in CDSs from AIG. It wasn't so much that Goldman realized AIG itself made go bankrupt, which later on would and the government had to bail them out. So Goldman spent 150 million insuring themselves against AIG potential collapse. They purchased CDSs against AIG. So just see the type of leverage they have you have in the system. You are using a third party to bet against something that you are selling. So Goldman Sachs is selling CDOs, but at the same time they are going to AIG to buy uh, uh, basically a speculation that these CDOs that they are selling, rated triple A, are going to fail. But they are so concerned that AIG is going to fail that they also buy a insurance against AIG failing and still AIG ends up failing and they need the government to bail both of them out. I mean, it's unbelievable. I wish they would actually fail in 2008 because if all of these banks and bad actors got flushed in 2008, our system today would be so much less leverage, so much uh, uh, more stable and would have so much less problems. I mean, would, it would be more, it would hurt more in 2008, it would maybe last a little bit longer, but we would have a much, you know, healthier market and economy today. Um, yeah, so now it says that in 2008, homes foreclosure were skyrocketing, home buyers in the subprime loans were defaulting on their payments, lenders could not longer sell their loans. Uh, to the investment banks and the loans went bad. Dozens of lenders failed. The market for the CDOs collapsed, leaving the investment banks holding hundreds of billions of dollars of loan CDOs and real estate they couldn't sell. Meanwhile, those who purchased up CDSs were knocking at the door to be paid. So these banks that were also selling CDSs, not only that they were making losses on their mortgages failing, they also had to pay to people like Michael Berry that were betting against them. Um, yeah, so what I want to say about this, in 2008, those banks were over leveraging, they were doing some shady business and they were supposed to fail, but they didn't. They were too big to fail back then, they are much bigger now and the government bailed them in 2008, so they didn't learn their lesson. What makes you think that they, you know, miraculously changed their behavior, that they are not you know, making risky loans. Of course they do. And we know that the derivative market since 2008 grew significantly. So we know there is much more risk in the system. We know that this kind of crazy, you know, financial engineering that you are betting against this guy. And I'm not against derivatives, but you know, we know that this grew. And we know that there was never free market forces to punish those people that acted badly. They were never flushed from the system. So these actors are still there. What makes you think if they got, if, you know, if they uh, they didn't get flushed in 2008, what makes you think that they changed their behavior? They didn't. Of course, there is still this shady behavior going on in the banks. Um, yeah, so now let's see what he's writing about. Yeah, so in 2020, in March, you can see that in the March collapse, we have had uh, a spike in the delinquency rate of mortgages. And those mortgages were commercial mortgages. So this is CMBs. And you can see that it rose even higher than the peak of the uh, great financial crisis in 2008. So there is obviously, there was a huge problem in the system and the Fed managed to calm it down. You can see that after that huge spike, immediately, and I believe that happened together with the exemption that were given to the banks, the SLR exemption, and also that uh, uh, they gave, uh, for example, people that had to pay mortgages, they told them, okay, you don't have to pay it now, you can pay it later. So they basically they kicked the can down the road 
again. I came across this very interesting article on Zero Hedge and just the three uh, key takeaways that they write on, you know, on the title, basically. If the Fed tapers QE, it may reveal a uh, waning appetite for long-term treasuries. The treasury may have issued its cash balance reserve to anchor inflation expectations. And three, if inflation persists, the Fed may have to increase rather than decrease QE. Now, let's just jump into the end of the article. It was all interesting, but I want to focus on what they're writing in the end. So, what about the short debt markets? Because as you know, reverse reports are mostly short term to let's say medium term uh, treasuries. Demand for short term debt seems to remain very strong. This makes sense as T bills mature in less than a year. So these investments are perceived as ne nearly risk free. In fact, it could be argued that the recent treasury bill issuance uh, uh, hitches could be causing stretch in the reverse repo market. Reverse repos could exceed 1.5 trillion by uh, coming Wednesday. And then you can see the graph of the reverse repos. Um, the current understanding seems to be that banks are, uh, you know, they, are, they have loads of cash, so much cash they are hitting the limits in terms of how much cash they can hold on balance overnight. But, and remember, it's cash and treasuries and they decide to get rid of cash. It makes sense. Also, some of it is speculation because treasuries, if rates go lower, the value of those treasuries goes higher. But with so much cash in the system, if it were all to be invested in short term debt instrument, it could drive rates negative. To avoid negative rates, the Fed is lending banks assets on its balance. The Fed is lending banks assets on its balance sheet overnight in exchange for cash. So the Fed is getting more cash overnight and the banks are getting those uh, short term uh, treasuries. And by the next day, they uh, they give the uh, they give the banks back the cash and the banks give the Fed back the treasuries. Treasury has been drawing down its cash balance and letting short term debt mature when there seems to be a strong demand in the market, question mark. The treasury must recognize the risk of having too much debt in the short term instruments and it's trying to lengthen the duration of its debt. Unfortunately, this abundance of cash in the repo market is in search for low risk short term debt. So it will not provide demand for long term debt. Uh, so, you know, the treasury want to issue more long term debt. Why? Because long term debt protect them from rising rates. If you take a mortgage for 30 years, then you don't have, you know, in a fixed rate mortgage, you don't have to worry about rates rising. I mean, you have to worry in 30 years, maybe if you have to refinance it, um, which is what the treasury is doing. There are selling debt and then when the debt mature they take new debt they pay the old debt and that's how it's going so if they take uh let's say if they sell one year or two year um debt in one or two years if rates are higher they have now to let's say rates today are close to zero if in two years rates are 10 percent suddenly they have to refinance all of their debt in 10 percent in only two years but if they have a 30 year debt then they don't have to worry about it for 30 years. That's why the treasury would rather sell more longer term debt. But the market is telling it, no, 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 we want zero risk and we consider zero risk short term debt. For example, one year or two years. And that's the problem. That's why the re that's what the article says. That's the, one of the reasons why the reversed repo market is exploding because the, there is a high, uh, there is a search for short term debt and a lot of cash to reiterate this is why it is imperative the market believes inflation is transitory if the treasury cannot stop issuing debt um sorry not if the treasury cannot stop issuing debt because they have to repay the old debt like i told you with new debt which leaves the fed unable to raise rates or type or Tapper QE without wrecking havoc in the bond market. Additionally, if the Fed has to fight inflation, 
then it's not just the treasury facing its, uh, you know, really chaotic moment, but the entire US economy. Wrapping up, the Fed, the treasury will have to begin reissuing debt again. Will it lean towards short term debt, hoping the Fed keeps interest rates low or long term debt, hoping the Fed will expand QE? And then write like that. Unfortunately, long term rates will not be tenable over the medium term as the government has to finance more and more debt. As the market this year has indicated, when issuing surplus the Fed's buying, rates have gone up. Basically, very in simple words, if the government want to issue debt and the Fed is not going to buy it, they're going to have to pay higher rates. So if they want to pay lower rates, the Fed will have to buy more of the debt because the, the demand outside of the Fed is not there. We know that foreigners didn't increase their debt, US debt holdings. So basically, most of those uh, treasuries were bought by the Fed. Fed was monetizing the debt. Without the Fed, rates would be much higher. Um, is this my, yeah. Uh, so what happens to rates when the Fed leaves the market entirely, presumably go up a lot? High, uh, how high will the Fed let rate go up before re-entering? The Fed can't let, that's now I'm saying you the answer. The Fed can't let rates go higher. Even I think even a half percent rise might crash completely the markets and the dollar is linked to the market. Everything is now connected. The dollar, the stock market and the bond market. And one of these failing will collapse the other two. Just because something is inevitable, US debt spiral does not make it imminent. However, the next six months of data may shine a bright light on all the responsibility over the last uh, 12 years if inflation proves not uh, uh, so transitory. Yes, we have to remember that all of this is uh, inevitable, but we don't know if it's going to happen, you know, right now. I don't know if it's going to happen tomorrow. It might happen tomorrow. It might not. But there will be a day when this happens tomorrow, you know, the day before something breaks. And obviously, it's not going to be so... Uh, you know, it's, gonna, it's not going to be so easy to notice that. If it was to notice that, then everyone would notice it before and it would happen before. So there will be a day when it's the day before something breaks. And we just don't, don't know where it's going to happen. I mean, we did have the last 12 years in 2008. And, you know, people have been calling for a, a currency crisis and it didn't happen. Can it take another 12 years? I doubt it. I think we are really close to something breaking in the system because everything that we said is going on because the debt expansion that is going parabolic so uh, that's what i believe uh, now i know guys i wish i could explain more you know in depth about the reverse repo market but honestly that's the as deep as my understanding goes uh, if you want to understand more than that I would maybe follow someone like uh, Jeff Snyder. And uh, yeah, it's really, really complex. I think there is not so many people that understand it. But what I try to do usually is I take a step backwards and then maybe another step backwards. And I try to look on the entire picture. And the way that the entire picture looks to me is that there is stress building up in many different places in the plumbing of... Uh, the economy of the monetary system and the Fed is constantly trying to patch these stress spots and I think like I said reverse repo is a symptom is the bad thing not necessarily not necessarily that by itself is a bad thing but it can be a symptom of something bad that is happening so we have to watch the repo market and the reverse repo market closely and that can give us an indication before something major happens do i think we are approaching some kind of a collapse i don't know i don't even know are we going to see a stock market crash because i'm not sure if we are going to have this massive you know deflationary uh, collapse of the stock market and uh, uh, you know like the deflationists are calling and then overreaction of the Fed to hyperinflation 
or are we just going to see something like a hyperinflation happens directly? So the stock market will never crash nominally. So in nominal uh, terms or in dollar terms, the stock market would go up. But in gold terms, in real terms, it will go down. And between these two options, I just don't know what is going to happen. I believe what we are seeing today is very similar to what was happening in France. And you can see people like Dan Oliver and Alastair McLeod talking about it. The Mississippi bubble. In the Mississippi bubble, the stock market was connected, or basically this one stock, this Mississippi company, was connected to the currency. And the bank was printing money, printing livras, and pumping the price of the stock. And everyone in the country got involved in stocks, in this particular stock. Everyone was buying it. Everyone was thinking they're becoming millionaires. Everyone was making a lot of money. And once, you know, it broke, once people wanted to get out of the stock, where they make a lot of profits, they thought it's overvalued. So once the price of that stock broke and they started getting Libras and they said, okay, I got my Libra, but I want my gold because Libras were backed by gold. That's when the Libra crashed. So the stock of the Mississippi company fell from 12,000 12, Libras to around like 4,000, something like that. But then the Libra collapsed so quickly that the stock uh, price didn't fall anymore. I think it even rose a little bit because the currency was crashing so fast that it doesn't matter that the, the, the stock is falling in real terms, in nominal terms, it was rising. So we may experience the same thing here. I mean, you can see even in the modern world, if you look on countries that experienced hyperinflation, their stock market were doing great in their local currencies, but in terms of purchasing powers, they were either stagnating or falling. So I don't know if we will have a stock market crash. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, there is two possibilities the way I see it, and one of them will happen. If you have a big cash position and we get a stock market crash, you just got a huge opportunity to become rich because you will be able to buy gold and gold stocks. On very, you will have a very short window. But if you have the balls and you, <laughs> you know, take your money and buy them, you'll probably make huge returns, huge returns. But if you uh, have smaller, uh, you know, cash holdings, you will have to have the courage and mental stability to hold inside your position, inside this turbulence when things go down, and uh, uh, you will definitely have very big profits, but not as big uh, when uh, you know gold starts to shoot higher when inflation gets out of control. That is for today. Thanks for watching and I will see you on the next video, guys.